Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, welcome to the FDR Presidential Library and Museum. I'm Paul Sparrow. I'm the director here. Uh, it's a beautiful day out there. It's a fantastic weekend, and we have a truly remarkable program lined up for you today. Uh, despite the fact that the library has been open for 76 years, this is the first official Churchill Lecture. Um, and so uh, you would think that a relationship as important as the Churchill Roosevelt relationship would be something that we would have dedicated a lecture series to, but this is the first. Uh, and it's uh, thanks to the generosity of Gordon Cohen, who's not here today. That's why this is the Gordon Cohen Churchill Lecture. Um, and his family is here. We'd like to say thank you for your support and for being here today. Uh, there will be another one next year. and hope, We hope that this will become an annual tradition. Um, and I think if you've had a chance to go over and look at our new exhibit, D-Day, uh, FDR and Churchill's Mighty Endeavor, um, you'll get to see some of these communications between the two of these men. It's really uh, quite an extraordinary, and some would say the most consequential friendship of the 20th century. Uh, and so today we're going to focus on uh, Winston Churchill and his uh, leadership under pressure and how that resonates even today. We have a, really an extraordinary panel. Um, on the far side we have Elliot Cohen, whose book uh, The Big Stick, uh, The Limits of Soft Power and the Necessity of Military Force, uh, he was also uh, an author and a scholar and a professor at Johns Hopkins University uh, and has been inside government uh, and had to address the issues uh, around national security and he brings an insightful eye to what the, the application of power really means in a crisis situation. Uh, then we have David Reynolds, who literally just flew here from uh, Christ College, Cambridge. His arms are killing him. Um, <laughs> he's, what, 11 books, 12 books, how many? I don't know. Uh, I love it. <laughs> uh, his most I'm recent kidding. book, uh, Kremlin Letters, is really extraordinary collaboration with this, uh, a Russian uh, um, scholar where they got unprecedented access to the uh, correspondence of Stalin uh, and, and really incredible research, but also a new perspective on the relationship between the big three and the Russian perspective on uh, World War II and, and the, the leadership. And then moderating the panel today is Richard Aldis from Bard College, who works on their international studies program, uh, a distinguished author and scholar in his own right. Uh, and this conversation is going to be, I, I think, a, a real first for the library. So we're so glad you're here today. Please welcome our panel. Well, good afternoon, uh, everyone, and thank you to Paul um, for that wonderful introduction and for organizing this event. Uh, the FDR Library really always does such a wonderful job of keeping the interest in the history of this period alive. Uh, and I think historians, not just locally, like myself here at Bard, but, but genuinely kind of throughout the profession and more broadly, um, are grateful for the work that they do. Um, uh, before we turn to my two very distinguished uh, guests here, um, I do just want to say uh, how wonderful it is uh, to be involved in this Gordon Cohen uh, lecture. Um, I first heard of Gordon Cohen when his granddaughter, uh, Sarah Alpert, who is sitting on the front row there today, um, it, it, during one of my British history classes at Bard, said, I have a grandfather who is absolutely crazy about history. He's coming up this weekend. I know it's a lot to ask, but please, would you mind just meeting him for a cup of coffee? I was very happy to do that. When I started talking to Gordon uh, at that coffee, he said, yeah, actually, I have an in a bit of an interest in Churchill, um, and I collect a few things. Uh, in fact, I, I just bought something this week. Um, and he started telling me about it. He said, yeah, it's the, it's the four volumes of uh, Churchill's uh, book on Marlborough. And they're signed editions, so, you know, very nice. Uh, the first two volumes are signed uh, to uh, the Prince of Wales. The third volume uh, is signed to His Majesty the King. And the fourth volume is signed to His Royal Highness the Duke of Windsor. So right there, in those four volumes, you have British, a British constitutional crisis uh, kind of sitting right in front of you. Um, so I came to realize that Gordon really is a very serious collector and indeed uh, has the most magnificent collection uh, of uh, th things related to Churchill. But much more importantly, 
He inspired uh, in, his in his granddaughter um, and in the family generally. I can see uh, Bruce, who's a great, uh, his uh, um, son-in-law, who's a great lover of history. He inspired that love of history. And so I think that this event is a wonderful uh, testament to the love of history that Gordon uh, has. Um, Our topic today is leadership under pressure. It's very much uh, rooted, firstly, in the wonderful uh, exhibition um, and events uh, around D-Day which are taking place here at the library. So that seems to me to be a really good place to start. Um, and maybe, David, first of all, tell us what the stakes are for D-Day and the kind of pressure that Churchill is under at that precise moment in history? So, in June 1944, British force, June 1940, British forces have left the continent of Europe uh, uh, ignominiously, though in retrospect miraculously, the evacuation at Dunkirk. Four years later, they are trying to re-establish a Western Front on the continent of Europe against Nazi Germany, re-establishing it not through their own efforts, not with significant support from the French, because the French had been defeated in 1940, but with, in an alliance with the United States, and also often forgotten in Britain uh, with, with Canada. Canadian forces is an important part of this story. Churchill is a man who has tried amphibious operations in the past. He's tried to land on foreign soil, and it's not been a happy experience. He lost his job in 1915 as First Lord of the Admiralty because of his association with the Gallipoli landings uh, against the, the Turks. Uh, in, 19, in April 1940, he was very lucky not to be the person fingered for the failure of the Norway Operations, the landings against uh, to try and preempt German attacks in Norway. So amphibious operations I have a, a bad track history for, from Churchill's point of view. He's also a man who has lived through the First World War, the loss of many of his contemporaries in the battles on the Somme at Passchendaele. Uh, he knows the limits of British manpower. He's afraid of another bloodbath. And he's also a man steeped in British history and the British way of warfare, which has been very often a maritime strategy, a peripheral strategy of wearing the enemy down. So going head to head across the channel is for Churchill a personally and historically huge thing to do. And it is only with great reluctance that he is persuaded that it has to be done now, persuaded partly by American pressure, partly by the logic of events. Uh, but if you read his correspondence in the weeks before, it's, it indicates his gradual coming to terms with this. He says, I'm hardening on this operation. Uh, uh, he's, but he's still dreading what might happen. And it's uh, mentioned in the exhibit, and I do urge you to go and look at it. It's a wonderful exhibit. But he, he and Clementine, his wife, have dinner the, the evening before, the 5th of June, uh, as the paratroops are taking off for, for, for France. And it's a pretty gloomy dinner. Uh, it doesn't say much. And then at the end of the dinner, as they go up to bed, he suddenly looks at her very sharply, and he says, you realize that by the time we get up in the morning, 20,000 men may be dead. That, of course, proves fortunately to be a, a gross overestimate, maybe 4,000 4, killed on D-Day. But Churchill is really afraid. He's worried about what's happening. So it's, it's a moment of incredible tension for him, as I think it is for Franklin Roosevelt, you know, 3,000 miles away. And, I mean, Elliot, it, it seems to me, and you've written about this, that one of the ways that he deals with precisely the kind of pressure that David is talking about, this historical sense, is that he doesn't just allow others to worry about the detail, that he is a man of, a, of system, 
he can seem chaotic, but actually the details really, really matter to him. Yeah, he, um, well, first, just to reinforce this, I, mean, I think it's important <clears throat> to understand that nobody was completely certain this was going to work. And in fact, the American Chiefs of Staff, Joint Chiefs of Staff, uh, flew to London as had been planned uh, a few days after the landings. And the original idea behind that had been that if it was necessary to make a decision to call the whole thing off, to liquidate the landings after they had occurred, that it would be good to have the American Joint Chiefs together with the British Chiefs so they could make that decision together. So there was a, uh, everybody realized that this was somewhat iffy. But to your, uh, to your point, Churchill, um, once he is convinced that an invasion of uh, France in 1944 is the way to go, uh, he gets very involved in the details to include the, um, the mobile docks, the mulberries, uh, there's a scheme for, uh, I think it was codenamed Pluto, which would be an under-channel uh, oil Shinya. pipeline. Yeah. So he gets very engaged in that, as, as he did throughout the war. I mean, he, um, I think one of the misconceptions about Churchill sometimes is that he would be this terrible micromanager, and this was completely inappropriate. Uh, you know, the truth is, if you look at the chief executive officer of any great corporation, they will get very involved in details. The measure of their leadership is, are they getting involved in the right details? So, you know, Steve Jobs, very famously with the iPhone, kind of wanted to make sure that you had the right clicking sound uh, when, you, when you turned it on, so there would be something sort of a satisfactory little thunk. Um, and that wasn't Steve Jobs micromanaging, that was Steve Jobs focusing on some very, very important details. And that's sort of the Churchillian pattern I would argue throughout the war. I mean, he certainly doesn't always get it right, but he, he did end up focusing on some of the, the critical details and just probing to make sure that they had been taken care of. I mean, it, it, I think it has to be said, as someone who is a university professor, I think it's very fortunate that Churchill never had a university education. Uh, he didn't think in those kind of ways. He was someone who, who could think big and also think detail. Right and also asked the untrained, but often very important questions. Um, and uh, in a way that's simply not true of most political leaders in Britain at that time, who'd had, if you like, a classical education, he was, he was a gadgets man. He was fascinated by how things worked. And he wanted to get down and find out, you know, what, so how exactly are we going to send, you know, put an oil pipeline under the channel? Or how are we going to build these artificial harbors? What are they going to work and all the rest of it? And, and that was you know, part of his maverick kind of genius. It didn't fit into a box. And that's part of why he was so difficult to deal with, but also so important. I think Isaiah Berlin kind of wrote about that, didn't he, where he said that part of Churchill's success and success in leadership is a bit like driving a car, that you don't think about driving a car in a general sense. You think about it in a very specific sense right. when you are confronted mm. with, uh, with, with a particular situation. Yeah. But I think in, in that respect, it's, we were talking a little bit about this before. Uh, this, this is a not uncommon leadership sort of experience. It's just on a scale infinitely vaster than most of us can, uh, can imagine. But there's a similar pattern with Churchill, say, during the Battle of the Atlantic, when he gets very, very focused on the details of how the convoys are being organized and what speed they're moving at and that sort of thing. He similarly gets very involved, um, really almost simultaneously with D-Day. The Germans launched the bombardment of London mm -hmm. with uh, V-1 cruise missiles and then later on uh, V-2 ballistic missiles. He gets deeply involved in that. And what it usually was, was he, when he understood that something was of critical importance, he would really dive down into the details. And in that respect, it's actually quite a good model, I think. And one of the things he really picked up on in a way that was, I think, again, very significant, was the importance of signals intelligence during the war. So if you go to the exhibit, you'll see, for example, one of the Enigma machines that the Germans used to code their messages. Um, and Churchill's 
support for the operation at Bletchley Park, which was the signals intelligence decrypting station north of London, was hugely important in helping to provide the Allies with the kind of information that uh, was essential for getting a knowledge of the German order of battle in June 1944. There's um, an excellent book's just been published called um, uh, Bletchley and D-Day by a man called David Kenyon, who's the official historian at Bletchley. I don't know whether it's been published in the States yet, but it brings out very well the huge systematic work they did to draw up uh, really a, a very, very, not perfect, but very strong impression of what the Germans were doing. And Churchill put money into that and political support into that uh, in a way that I think no other British Prime Minister would have done. There's, there's another uh, sort of D-Day story which speaks to a, a different kind of uh, focus on details, and that's personalities. So, you know, the British landings at uh, D-Day go considerably better than those at uh, Omaha Beach. And one reason is the British had a whole division uh, composed of some very odd-looking tanks with flails and plows and stuff like that. Known as funnies. The funnies, yeah. <laughs> yes. uh, was it was the 79th Division or something like that. Uh, well, the commander of it was a man named Percy Hobart, uh, who had been one of the pioneers of armored warfare in Great Britain in the 1920s. He was retired. He had sort of an unsavory reputation in the British uh, Army. And at the beginning of World War II, Churchill, who had an eye for that kind of character, tries to find out what's happened to Percy Hobart. Well, he's serving as a corporal in the Home Guard. Mm. And Churchill goes to the chief of the Imperial General Staff, uh, Sir John Dill, and says, won't you call him back on active duty? And said, well, you know, ugly divorce and a very unpopular character. And Churchill famously says, my dear Field Marshal, it's not just the nice boys who help us to win wars. It's the sneaks and the stinkers as well. <laughs> well, um, and actually Hobart turned out to have been exactly the right guy to develop the kind of specialized units that you were going to, because he was an out of the box mm. sort of thinker to allow you to get through the German, uh, the German defenses on the, on the shores of Normandy. Yeah, to clear, clear some of the mines and, and um, uh, impedimenta that had been put down. Um, they had flail tanks, for example, yep. which had a long uh, uh, track which you used to sort of blow up the, the mines and so on. And uh, I mean, there are many reasons why there were problems on Omaha Beach, but as opposed to other beaches, but the British beaches and, uh, were, were somewhat helped by that yep. kind of, those kind of contraptions. Yep. Yeah. Let's talk a bit about um, Churchill personally under pressure as well, the kind of emotional and physical uh, pressures that he would have found himself at under this, at, at this kind of time. We often uh, hear the stories about his drinking and kind of so on, mm. but I mean he was always having to find a way to get a release to still be able to do the job. Yeah, I mean this is you know, this is a senior citizen who's doing this job. I mean, he is uh, 69 in 1943 at Tehran. He has his 69th birthday with Roosevelt and Stalin at Tehran. Um, so he's long past his uh, sell-by date in some ways. Indeed, he'd, he'd been out of office since 1929 until 1939. And for many people, that was really the sign that Winston was finished. What's striking, if you look at some of the pictures of Churchill, is that in the mid-30s, he's, he's very puffy. And there's a sense of a man who's kind of going to seed. And all, in the war, the early part of the war, although those jowls are there and so on, there's, there's much more of a sort of firmness about the face. It's as if the, he's really tanked up by the the prospect of, 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 of conflict and of war. And this is, after all, a man who has, he's known war. He's fought in the British Army. He fought in one of the you know, great, last, supposedly last cavalry charges, British Army at Omdurman and so on. He's killed people in battle. He knows what it's like to be shot at, to shoot. And he, he's galvanized by it in a way that is not true of the other people who, well, who were around at the top at the time. Neville Chamberlain, who was Britain's prime minister, in 1939, has given his whole political career as prime minister stopping a war. He's feeling defeated. The alternative we were talking about, Lord Halifax, is a man who's physically sick at the prospect of being a war leader. 
Churchill is really tanked up by it. And that adrenaline, I think, gets him through at least a good part of the war, just simply that, that sense of this is the mission I've been, you know, my life has been a preparation for. So I, I would add a, a couple, I think that's completely right, but I would add a, a few other things. One is, you know, at this point, he has been at war for five years, and there is a kind of accumulating, accumulating fatigue and stress, and it becomes noticeable in how he's interacting with, uh, with other people. He's also, I think, and it's very important for Americans to realize this, I mean, he, he is living in the middle of a war zone. London is a war zone. He is visiting the bombed out population. Yeah. Uh, he himself has to be in a shelter, which is not, particular. if you go to the Churchill War Rooms, which you should, uh, in London, you see it. This is not a particularly well-ventilated <laughs> area. Um, so there's, there's some physical discomfort. He knows lots of people who have lost family members, and um, he was a very emotional kind of guy, so I think he, although there was a ruthless side to him, there was also a side that is feeling mm. the casualties. I would say that there are two other things which help keep him going. One is, um, you know, for all the stories about the drinking and what have you, it's in some ways it's a very disciplined life. He takes that famous afternoon nap, and you don't wake him up mm. from the nap. You really don't. And in general, you, you don't wake him up at night. So I'm, I'm always amused when uh, you, know, you hear these discussions about is this, you know, can the president take a uh, 3 a.m. phone call? Churchill's never woken at no. 3 a.m. And, and he would have thought it was crazy to do it. Or I remember when you know, the, uh, there's a picture during the Obama administration and the, the raid um, to uh, uh, get Osama bin Laden of the the president and the entire cabinet hunched around the table looking at the television. I mean, Church would have thought that's crazy. Mm -hmm. You know, you don't do that. You just, you're supposed to be relaxed and in charge. So th that or going out to checkers, watching movies at night, uh, eating pretty well. He, uh, taking time to paint when he could. I think he, he managed the, what, what we would now call self-care pretty well. The other thing is, I think he was very fortunate to have Clementine mm, as, as a wife. There's a wonderful, wonderful letter, I wish I could reproduce it from memory, which she slips under his door around June 26th or something like that of 1940. And this is when, you know, the French are suddenly out of the war. It's not clear the, how helpful the Americans are going to be. The Germans, you know, have really occupied the entire European coastline. And she's saying, you know, dear, you're being brusque. <laughs> You're being somewhat rude to your subordinates, and that's not like you. You know, I'm used to those working with you, loving you, and it's ex it's an ex it's a extraordinary. You can find it online or in. Uh, mm -hmm. There's a great collection of the the correspondence between them. It, it's a um, a wonderfully loving rebuke by his wife, and I think she actually played a very large role in kind of yeah. keeping him centered. And she wrote that one weekend and tore it up. Yep. And the following weekend, she did it again and put it under the door. Um, she knew this was, you know, she was going right to the edge on this. But uh, I absolutely, I agree with Elliot, you know, she was invaluable to him, and he exhausted her every few months she would go off for a rest cure because he was so impossible to deal with. He was so demanding. And many people who worked with him had that same sense that, you know, he was really insufferable. You know, the secretaries and the demands he'd make on them for dictation at late at night and all the rest of it. Yet, I remember one of them said, uh, Joe Sturdy, who said, you know, it was like, he was awful, but you wouldn't have missed it for the world because you had a sense of somebody whose ego was huge, but it was bound up with even bigger things. Yeah. And it was a kind of privilege to, to work with him. And I think there were only a, a few, a very, very few secretaries who just completely fell out with him. You know, the, the, you just you rose to that, that kind of occasion. Um, but Clemmy was, I think, absolutely essential in order to, to, to keep him going. Uh, and he was, you know, he's totally undomesticated. Um, on one occasion, he was, um, he wanted to go down to his favorite home, Chartwell in Kent, uh, 
for, for a day or so to, you know, maybe to rest or maybe to paint if he could and so on. And, and Clemmie said, Winston, it's completely mothball for the, for, the, for the war, you know, there's dust sheets everywhere, there's no staff anywhere, uh, and anyway, you can't cook. And he said, I can boil an egg. <laughs> I've seen it done. <laughs> <laughs> Well, that, but you know, that's another thing too, his sense of humor. Sense of humor, absolutely, yes. Yeah. Uh, yes. You know, the, in John Colville's, uh, his personal secretary's memoirs, uh, one of the things that really struck me about it is he, he says that during his whole time working for Churchill, including during the darkest days of 1940, so you could always hear laughter mm. in the corridors of uh, 10 Downing Street. Mm. And that's, I, yeah. I think that's a large, a sense of humor is a large part yeah. of this too. Yeah, yeah. So let's, um, let's think about Churchill in the context of some of his contemporaries, obviously FDR here at the, uh, the FDR library, and Stalin. Um, D David, you have a, a fascinating line in the, uh, in the Stalin letters where you say that uh, Churchill was a card player, but Stalin was a chess player. Can you maybe tell us something about that and their different mindsets and in how they dealt with... Uh, leadership during this wartime situation? Mm. Well, I, I, I go start in a sense slightly differently that one of the things that's striking about Churchill before the war, and particularly in 1938, is that um, he is fundamentally opposed to Neville Chamberlain going to meet Hitler in September 1938. Um, the summitry that Chamberlain conducts, which at the time is regarded as amazing, you know, a prime minister taking to the air and flying to meet the German Fuhrer. And uh, Churchill's view is that on that one, Chamberlain should have called Hitler's bluff. Going to see the German Chancellor, paying in a sense, taking him seriously, uh, feeding his, his, his ego and so on, this was fundamentally wrong. And on that one, Churchill um, Churchill gambled and gambled, I think, rightly. Um, in the wartime situation, he is a man who is in a different position with regards to Stalin. He is someone who now realizes that the Russians from 19, the summer of 1941 are carrying the brunt of the war effort against Germany, and he has to build a relationship uh, you have to deal with the Russians. You have to keep them going. He cannot imagine a second front early in 1941 or 42 or 43 because of the British and the Americans are not prepared, because of the dangers of crossing the channel, all the things that you know, he's still worried about in April 44. So part of what he does is to gamble on diplomacy, to go see Stalin, to try and build a relationship. Hence the card player. And can, yes, and so... He concludes from meeting Stalin, who is a very different figure from the other dictators. And, and anybody, if you talk to people who, who dealt with Stalin, or I once talked to Frank Roberts, who was a British diplomat who'd met, who worked with, dealt with Stalin, Hitler, and Mussolini. And he said, you know, if you went to see Hitler, you got a rant. You know, he just mount, rants up and down, and fume, and all the rest of it. And you had to just sit there for two hours and then repeat the message that you were supposed to come and deliver. Um, Mussolini was a comic opera guy in fancy dress and you know bombast and so on. Stalin, very quiet, very restrained, um, it never really looked at you. He would sit there and doodle and then uh, you made your comments and then he would kind of look up and he would not look quite in your eyes, he'd look to your left or right or so over your shoulder. But he'd make a very clear um, um, and direct comment, you might like, like the answer, but you had a feeling, yeah, we're having a conversation. And Churchill basically gambled on that conversation. So here is a man who, on the one hand, is absolutely opposed to Bolshevism and communism and socialism, and who can see that one of the possibilities out of this war is that communism is going to spread across Europe. But he has no choice but to deal with the Russians, and so he gambles on the possibility of building a personal relationship with this surprisingly agreeable mass murderer. 
You know, he, that's always at the back of his mind, but, you know, I can sort of do business with this guy. So it's a big gamble, but I think that's, um, that's what he was, he was doing. And, and very much this idea that you know, personality, personality matters. matters. Yeah. 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 He, you know, he, he also has two other considerations. And earlier on in the war, in 42 and 43 in particular, the, the British are still very worried that the Russians might sign a, a separate peace mm -hmm. with Hitler. Um, and there's this historical controversy where there are were there initiatives through the Swedes or something like that? And if so, were they serious or not? But it's, it was clear that it was an anxiety of the British leadership that um, you could imagine circumstances where Hitler and Stalin, who after all had done one deal, might do another. Later on in the war, uh, by the time particularly you get to 44, Churchill's big strategic concern is the Russians will control large swaths of Europe and the British, who will be broke, will be left alone, as he says, left alone with the bear. Because nobody expects the Americans to be in Europe mm. after World War II. We, you know, it's I, one of the most uh, challenging things, I think, about understanding history is realizing, well, we know how it turned out. But they certainly didn't, didn't know, know how it was going to turn out. And they certainly did not expect that there would be an American presence with NATO and and President Roosevelt said very clearly, you yeah. can't expect me to keep American troops in Europe for more than a year or so after Germany's defeat. So, he, so this is a real, I mean, there's an element of desperation to it, and it, it leads him to do things which he probably hated, which he did hate doing, but mm -hmm. he then sort of justified to himself, which, of which probably the worst is the betrayal of the Poles, mm -hmm. who, uh, one of the most poignant moments in the war is when they finally have the victory parade mm -hmm. in London, the Poles aren't allowed to march and mm. you know the highest because we've already recognized the communist government in Warsaw. Right. Yes. Yeah. Uh, mm. and this is after you know the Poles had the some of the best fighter pilots in the Royal Air Force and yeah. they had taken Monte Cassino and all that and they they're they feel betrayed and to some extent they are betrayed and Churchill feels that he doesn't really have much of a choice mm. about the matter but that if you like is also brings up the sense of moral pressure on leaders I mean I think yes you know I mean, I do. I, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a habitual backstairs, states, a back, backseat statesman in the sense, you know, I can, I can write about what they ought to have done. But I'm always trying to remind myself that, you know, it's very different if you're in the front seat or if you're in the driving seat. And there are no perfect answers. It's basically always about choosing between a, a you know, a lesser or greater evil or something like that. And for Churchill, the Polish case is absolutely that. Uh, Britain has gone to war in 1939 ostensibly to protect Poland because we have signed a, a treaty of guarantee of Poland's, um, uh, Poland's independence. And Churchill does regard this as a debt of honor. And he puts an enormous amount of time into trying to get some kind of agreement between Stalin and the Poles. And looking at that correspondence um, between them, in uh, the early months of 44, after the Durham meeting, there's a huge number of messages. Churchill writes endlessly and at great length to Stalin, trying to say, well, you know, if you can work this out, we can sort out the Polish borders and the government. I mean, it, really, he does try. Uh, Roosevelt is in a different situation because Americans have not signed a Treaty of Guarantee of Poland, and Roosevelt is a much, much clearer about his priorities. The priority is to bring Russia in from the cold into some kind of international organization after the war, and basically the Poles have to be considered as expendable. And uh, on one occasion at Tehran, uh, when they're actually having a three-sided conversation about um, Eastern Europe, Roosevelt says, it's not in the, these ar the archives here, but it's in one of the British diaries, he says, um, when they're talking about Poland, he says, uh, uh, wake me up when we get to Germany. I don't care a damn about Poland. Um, whereas Churchill could not be in that position. No. He felt he couldn't, and yet he had to accept the moral burden of having betrayed the Poles. Uh, and that was something that was part of, if you like, the pressure of leadership, these, uh, 
decisions you have to live with. And when he was writing his memoirs, one of the parts that was particularly problematic was dealing with the Katyn massacre, which was discovered in April 43, and clearly the Russians were to, to blame, though they claimed, Stalin claimed it was the Germans. Uh, the British and the Americans knew pretty clearly at the time that this was a bunch of lies, but you couldn't say that given the importance of the Red Army on the Eastern Front. So you got into a real moral mess on that, and that would be, you know, I think a, a striking example of, of the things that Churchill you know, had to live with as, as being a, a leader. Yeah, and I mean, t some of these questions are political, some of them are military, some of them are moral. When we talk about Roosevelt as well, we talked about Churchill and physical strain. Mm. There's a whole other level, isn't there, with Churchill having to deal with the physical demands of being president uh, right at the crux of this. Uh, you mean Roosevelt? Roosevelt, yeah, yeah Roosevelt, right at the crux of this um, major global war. Yeah, I mean, we were just reminding ourselves beforehand, you know, this is a president who's been in office since 1933, and he's been through, you know, one of the worst crises of American domestic history and then of, of, of foreign policy yeah. as well. Um, and so, uh, I mean, the the demands on him physically are very great, and the visit that he pays to Tehran to meet Stalin is the beginning of the end. Um, and again, it's, it's documented very well in the exhibit, you know, that afterwards he doesn't recover from his trip. Four months in, his daughter Anna finally persuades him to have a proper checkup at Bethesda. The results are not good. Um, and you're dealing with in many ways, a dying president yeah. of that, that last 18 months. The, I mean, the advantages that Roosevelt had, I think, were, first, he was much less sentimental than Churchill, so there, there was an inequality in the relationship. I mean, Churchill could be quite unsentimental, too, but uh, Churchill had more invested in it. The other thing is Roosevelt was well aware that he had the strongest hand to play in the world. You know, this vast country with mm -hmm. enormous industrial potential that was not within range of anybody who could do it any damage. And even more important than that, in some ways, he had this naturally optimistic outlook mm. about not only what he could personally do, but what the United States could do. You know, Churchill, I'd be, I'd be curious to know what David thinks, in some ways, long-term optimist about the British Empire, although that's kind of hard to sustain by the end of the war, but he, you know, he saw the darker possibilities of um, how all this could turn out. You see that in some of his speeches early on in uh, 1940, where he's posing very stark uh, possibilities. But but in general, he had more of the dark in him. There was a there's a wonderful uh, little essay by Isaiah Berlin, uh, Mr. Churchill in 1940, which is a review of the first volume of the war memoirs. And really, what it is is it's a country contrasting Roosevelt and Churchill. And of course, Isaiah Berlin knew mm. Roosevelt because he had uh, worked in the, the embassy in, uh, British Embassy in Washington during the war. And, and that's really one of his points, that uh, Roosevelt was more basically sort of optimistic, where there's more dark in Churchill's view of the world. And I think in a way, that meant that he didn't have some of the armor that FDR um, that FDR had. But also for, I mean, you know, it is an amazing time in American history, and it's, it's the point at which the United States does become a world power. You know, there was the, the, mo the Wilsonian moment, but it's a brief yeah. one. And, you know, if you think back over those previous few years before 1944, I mean, in the, you know, early 1940, President Roosevelt is you know, looking to come back to this library that's being built here, write his memoirs. He's got, I think, a contract with Collier's magazine yes. for, you know, fortnightly, two every, an article every two weeks. You know, he's preparing for a completely different 1940s no. than, mm -hmm. than actually happened. And then, uh, for me, I think <laughs> one of the most pressured times for Roosevelt is actually 1940, because here's a man who is going to try and do something that is uh, you know, defies tradition, run for a third term because he thinks this is vital that he's going to stay in office. And like all great leaders, 
ego and mission kind of come together. You know, nobody else can do this job, only I can. Um, and anyway, I would be bored going back to Hyde Park, you know, <laughs> just writing a newspaper column. But what does he do? He does, he, he, he has selective service, the draft, imposed before the November election in September 1940. I mean, incredible gamble. He sticks his neck out about 50 destroyers to Britain. Um, he wouldn't have done any of that, I think, if the British had uh, succumbed. Obviously, it would have retreated to a kind of Western Hemisphere defense policy. But he's taking huge gambles. And then there's that growing sense of American power. Again, the, in the exhibit, they, you've got the, um, was it December 29th? speech in 1940, the great arsenal of democracy. We've got to be the great arsenal of democracy. And you kind of get a sense of Roosevelt appreciating what it is that America's going to do in this war. It's going to pull out of the Depression and devote that huge, uh, you know, this, this continent-wide country uh, to the war effort. And then you know, he doesn't expect Pearl Harbor. I mean, that's, you know, in some ways, uh, you know, partly American diplomacy is, is, is a fault there for sending the wrong signal, whatever it is. You know, it's a, it's a checkered story. But by 1944, it must be a president who can see a different kind of world dawning and has this amazing vision for it, you know, with the four freedoms, with the, the rhetorical statements about how it's going to be a world based on American values as well as American power. And whether he thinks troops will st American troops will stay in Europe or not, right. you know, historically he feels he's on a, a country on the up, whereas Churchill instinctively knows he right. is a country yeah. on the down. Yeah, and, and of course, I mean, there, the Americans are already thinking about what's the global financial order. Yeah. Some of his most ferocious fights with Churchill are over things like imperial preference. This is going to be an open trading yeah order, which is, poses really serious problems for the Brits. But I, I think also, you know, Roosevelt sort of understood just the amount of raw power that the United States had unleashed. Mm -hmm. So he knew we weren't going to go back to isolationism, but it's, uh, I mean, it is staggering. The one statistic which always captures for me the, uh, what the Americans were like in World War II, by the end of 1943, there is a fully manned aircraft carrier uh, showing up in the Pacific every two weeks, a brand new one. Mm. It's a staggering feat of production, let alone all the other stuff that's, that's going on. And he is very much on top of that and very much aware of that. And I think it, it's, it's really buoying him mm -hmm. in a way. Whereas, I mean, to go back to where we were on D-Day, you know, it's not just Churchill. I think all the British leaders knew D-Day was the only roll of the dice that they could throw. That if, if that failed, there wasn't going to be another push no. across the channel. They had one go, yeah. and that was it. Um, that wasn't the American sensibility. But also, of course, the um, you know when once you you land, I mean, they get a fo they get a foothold on D Day. Um, th the landings are successful. But, and that's a huge achievement across 50 miles of beachhead and so on, 150,000 men. But exploiting the beachhead is very slow. They were supposed to be to take Bayeux and Caen on the first day. You don't take Caen, city of Caen, till I think July the 21st. Um, breaking out of the beachhead is very slow. And Churchill's worry was not necessarily that we would fail to land, but we would we would end up with a sort of another Dunkirk situation. We'd eventually be pushed back, mm. pushed off. So it's not like you know, everything's fine on December, June the 7th. He's still chewing his nails, if you like. Um, but what, you know, there was a lot of criticism, for example, from American uh, generals and officers and journalists of uh, Montgomery, the British commander, for failing to take Caen and all the rest of it. Montgomery has been told very clearly by the War Office in London that he, there are now very few trained replacement combat troops coming on stream. So he has got to be really careful about casualties. Yep. Whereas Roosevelt, like Church, is a democratic leader. He can't throw troops into battle in the profligate way Stalin does. But in the end, he knows there are division after division of George Marshall's 
trained army now ready, you know, coming across the Atlantic yeah. in the next months and so on. So again, it's a very different story for, for, the, for the Brits and the Americans. One of the things as well that's fascinating about this period when we're thinking about leadership under pressure is that we also have figures emerging who will be very important mm. in the 1950s. We've got de Gaulle, who will go on to be president of France, and of course Eisenhower, uh, who will go on to be the president of the United States. So what kind of lessons do you think they learn in the 40s which they then apply in the, in the 1950s. Well, I'll, I mean, I'll say one about uh, de, de Gaulle. De, the lesson that de Gaulle learned is you can't trust the Americans. I mean, mm -hmm. one of, I think you can argue that one of um, Roosevelt's foreign policy errors, he had made a number of great decisions. <coughs> Excuse me, but probably the worst decision he made was really this just kind of visceral hostility to uh, de Gaulle, and it had a number of, there were a number of reasons for it. Partly he felt that de Gaulle was this man on horseback figure. Uh, but Churchill was deeply frustrated with de Gaulle, and actually they're very near a, a you know, really permanent breach at D-Day. But at the end of the day, uh, Churchill understood that, that de Gaulle represented something very deep about France, and realized that you had to get along with him, and in particular that you had to let the Gaullists run France after liberation, and Roosevelt just mm. pushed back against mm. that. And, and de Gaulle, who had a great respect for, for Churchill, you know, at one point Churchill says, look, in any conflict between you and the Americans, we are always gonna go with the Americans. And de Gaulle completely understood that logic. But for him, you know, the lesson learned was mm. France has to be independent and you cannot trust the Americans, really, and that I think that was a, a very large uh, a lesson learned. I mean, Eisenhower is a completely different figure. I think a lot of the lessons he learned were essentially political. Mm. Uh, you know, one of the reasons why he was the right guy to be the supreme um, the supreme commander was not because of his more narrowly military skills at operational planning. It's he learned to be a very adroit politician and particularly managing a, a coalition and managing things back home. And of course he took that forward as well. I mean, going back to de Gaulle, I think the other thing is of course that the French were totally humiliated in 1940. Um, uh, they were defeated in you know, four weeks. Uh, one statistic I'm struck by is that in the First World War, 1.3 million Frenchmen die uh, in the defense of their country and to cleanse their country from German occupation. In June 1940, 1 1.3 million Frenchmen march off to German prisoner of war camps. Um, and that's a humiliation that the French have still not come to terms with and I think it's still there for Macron today. Um, more specifically, uh, Churchill is a Francophile. If you ask, you know, uh, how often did he come to America, how often did he go to France, uh, partly for reasons of geographic proximity, but also because of his close connection with France, he's visited it many, many times over the, over the years. Um, he also believes, because again, he's in a different geographical position from Roosevelt, that it is essential to rebuild France, if you can, as a power in Europe, partly because there's no guarantee there will be an American presence in Europe yeah. after the war, partly because you might have to prepare for a resurgent Germany, and also because things may go wrong with the Soviet Union. So in all respects, an Anglo-French entente is important. And it's, although the French don't acknowledge it, it's because of the British that the French get a position in the occupation of Germany uh, that's agreed at Yalta against the preferences of Roosevelt and Stalin. But the other thing about them on a more personal level is that um, they're both men who have a huge sense of their country's history, of, of pride in their country's history. And of course that history has often been one of collision between Britain and France, but nevertheless they respect that you know, national pride in each other. And there is a passage Churchill wrote for his war memoirs, which was not included, but for me, I think, when I was writing about Churchill's war memoirs, I was very struck by it. It seemed to me it summed up 
the relationship. Churchill wrote, um, I would not lift, li wish to live in a country governed by de Gaulle, but I would not wish to live in a world where there was no de Gaulle. <laughs> and I think that kind of sums that mm. up. I'm kind of thinking that, I mean, you mentioned uh, President Macron there, you know, maybe to think about how these lessons, if they are lessons, um, how policymakers can apply them uh, today. I mean, Elliot, it's particularly interesting. You are somebody who's worked as a historian. You've written on history, but you've also seen things from the other side of the aisle. Um, you were the uh, counselor of the Department of the State of uh, Department of State during the uh, Bush 43 administration. When you go into a job like that, as somebody who thinks as a historian. To what extent is that history important when you're actually making policy, when you're making decisions? Well, um, I think it's, you know, the word lessons is a very dangerous, mm. uh, uh, dangerous one. Um, uh, you know, my, my friend Hugh Strom likes to say, uh, history may give you questions, it really doesn't give you mm. lessons, and I agree with that. Um, there's also a danger of any president or prime minister begin, beginning to think of themselves as being on the heroic model. I think that the, the, the journalist uh, Joseph Alsop once said that uh, when a president begins to, when a politician begins to compare themselves to Abraham Lincoln, it, it's time to send for the men in white suits uh, to carry them off. Um, but I think, it, first, it is the case that it's, at some point, anybody at really the top of, very top of government, will begin to see themselves in, in the context of history with a capital H. Uh, that can sometimes actually be very distorting and get them away from um, matters at hand. I, I think what, you know, being soaked in many different kinds of history, particularly history of conflict or diplomatic history teaches you, though, uh, and this is something I certainly I believe before I went into government and was powerfully reinforced by when I was in, that you know, ideas are important and concepts are important and uh, we professors tend to overvalue them. Uh, really what matters most is the ability to implement and to do and to organize and, and the ability to persevere. I mean, I think that's uh, in some ways, I came out of government with a, a greater admiration, if possible, uh, for the ability of people like Churchill and Roosevelt, simply to, particularly Churchill, to persevere in the middle of a mm. you know, course of years of just you know one failure after another. Because I mean, we talk about pressure, but you know, you're one of the people in the room who has experienced that kind yeah. of pressure. I mean, you were there. Kind of uh, during yeah. the during the war in Iraq, yep. um, the the financial crash, and so on. Yeah, and it's. Um, I mean, the, the good news for us is we could see the uh, the end of end of the road. Uh, uh, but I think that p perseverance, and then also being able to make course corrections of one kind or another. That's um, you know you begin to realize how difficult mm. that can be. It's very hard for any political or military leaders say, boy, well, we really screwed that one up. Let's, <laughs> let's try something completely different. But, but they have to be able to at least tacitly acknowledge that. Um, and it requires an open mind. And it does require the ability of senior leadership to hear people saying, boss, you're not going to like to hear this, mm -hmm. but. Um, and I think that is one of, you know, that's one of the qualities that um, Churchill had, I think Roosevelt had, even Stalin, I mean, I'll defer to, to David on this, but I think Stalin, you could give Stalin bad news up to a point as long as the bad news was really accurate uh, and it didn't necessarily re reflect on him. I think it was much harder to give Hitler bad news. Yeah. I mean, that really, he couldn't process, um, he couldn't process bad news. And so being the kind of leader who could have around you people who would look you squarely in the eye and say, I disagree, mm 
uh, I think we underestimate how how difficult a thing that that really is because you know at some point these leaders are really all, they I mean it's a cliche you know it's lonely at the top it really is I mean it's all on them and to have some one of your talented subordinates say but I think you're wrong mm -hmm. and then for you to be able to admit that maybe I have been wrong that is so much more difficult mm -hmm. than anything that ever happens in the classroom I can't tell you uh, going off, going off those, I think, very interesting comments, and I just put them in a slightly different way. One of the things I say to students, if they're studying a particular topic in diplomacy or whatever, you know, you're, well, so what, what are the British relations with Poland during the war and so on, is get out the newspapers from the time. I mean, you know, look at them on, you, they're online now and so on. What else, what is on the front page? What else is happening in the world apart from that little thing you were supposed to be studying? Because then you begin to get a sense of the agenda that a leader is having to deal with uh, of all sorts of things, you know, not just diplomatic, because a lot of the problems are domestic political, they are, you know, party political wrangles. I mean, you know, it's just get real, because when you're in power, you don't just sit down for uh, a period of time and say, now I'm going to think this morning about pun. You're just dealing with everything. It's coming right. in every direction. And the hardest thing is to carve out some time to think. And my only experience of anything like power, it's kind of laughable, was being head of department at, at Cambridge. Um, and what it taught me very quickly was the sense you get from many more, more self-conscious people who have been right in, in serious power, is the closer you are to the sense of power, the, the center of power, the more impotent you feel. That actually, you know, I'm supposed to be able to pull all these, but I can't do it. Or it's much more complex than I think and all the rest of it. Um, and I found that very, very sort of salutary to realize that. And I think there's a story Rex Tugwell told, which he must have got from Roosevelt, about going into the Oval Office at the very beginning of the presidency and so he was just wheeled in there. And of course, when we talk about Roosevelt, we just have to remember, he, this is a man you know, whose every day has got to fight against the fact that he's a paraplegic. And that's a huge act of courage um, and determination. He's wheeled in, and there's an empty room, empty desk. There's nothing, there's no, <laughs> there was nothing to write on. There's no paper. And there was a moment where Roosevelt apparently said, you know, there was a sort of wave of almost panic came over him. He said, I'm president of the United States, what the hell am I going to do? You know? and, um, and that sense of, of the isolation, the loneliness of power, which you were talking about, is, is, I think, very palpable. And most of these men did rely very strongly on someone who would talk back, uh, who would be very loyal, but would talk back. I mean, Harry Hopkins, I think, yeah. did it when he was well enough to do so. Churchill um, has, uh, you know, his chief of the Imperial General Staff, Alan Brooke, is an Ulsterman who has a, a raging temper, and if he, uh, if he thinks Churchill is wrong, he tells Churchill he's wrong. Um, and Churchill takes that. Um, Roosevelt also has a man in George Marshall who is, uh, you know, what, Rose, what Marshall really thought of politicians, we don't want to know. I mean, he was very aloof from it. But, a man utterly loyal and would give you straight, straight advice. And those are the kind of people that I think it's harder and harder to cultivate the longer a leader is in power because inevitably you get cocooned, don't you, from that, the reality. I mean, everything is done for you. Everybody does what you want them to do. And the illusion of your omnipotence and your uh, you know, uh, permanence is, is there in every leader. I mean, it happened to whoever, in Margaret Thatcher, it happens to Churchill in his own way, you know, later on. Um, so fighting against that and being self-conscious enough to know that you need people to help you fight against it is something that requires a, a particular skill as a leader, I think. Uh, you know, I think, again, just, uh, it, I think it's very good for any historian to have some executive mm. experience because you know, we experienced this on the, uh, I'm now my school's vice dean. Well, you get the same sort of thing. I mean, the staff will not always tell me everything mm -hmm. 
that mm. they know I won't be happy uh, to hear. And this is, of course, just on an infinitely faster scale. The other thing I wanted to pick up on was what you said, David, about the newspapers. One of the things that, that hit me in government, and it's absolutely true for these people, is there's a lot of stuff going on. And somehow it's all going to cascade onto them. And they have to figure out what are the really important mm. things. I mean, I, I just remember always being stunned by you go to uh, Condi's morning meeting and you go around the room and the, every single part of the world, something's going on. And because it's the United States, even if we make a decision not to act, that's a, con that's a consequential decision. You know, if you're Luxembourg, there may, there may be t terrible things going on in Southeast Asia, but really nobody expects you to do anything about it. Um, in the United States, it's, it's different. And for these two global powers, which is what both Britain and the United States were during World War II, there's all that, plus there's domestic politics. And I think we sometimes let the domestic politics leach out of you know, these grand strategic narratives uh, that we have, but domestic politics is continuing too. And they always have to be thinking about that as well. So I think that, <coughs> that ability to decide what are the things I'm gonna focus on, uh, that's, a, uh, that, that's a real skill, and not everybody has that. Mm. Well, I think it may be time to put our two guests under pressure uh, by turning over to the audience uh, for questions. Um, so if you'd like to raise your hand, and maybe I'll take two or three questions um, together. Yes. Thank you. So both FDR and Churchill had started as having very nationalist uh, focus for before the war and became coordinated internationalists. They, FDR had the Liberty League and the isolationist. Churchill writes about nations and the body of nations. So if you can do the favorite thing that people love, can you uh, resurrect them in current politics today? What do you think that they would think in a domestic focus about whether it's Brexit or uh, the removal of, uh, of the dissolution of some of the American uh, European coalition, do you think they'd be in favor of it as it sits now, or do you think they'd have anything to say about it? Should we take one more? Anybody else want to? Uh, yes, at the back. Thank you. So the, mi the microphone is just coming. In follow up to that, I was just wondering what you would think Churchill's view would be of President Trump's meeting with the uh, North Korean dictator and Putin. I don't know which one of you wants to go first. <laughs> be my guest. I, you know, uh, I can tell you my views and I could call them Churchill's. Um, <laughs> But, but um, and I'm happy to share my views, but um, you know, it's in the nature of things. We, we don't know because they haven't lived all the things that have happened since. But, but what I, I think what I would say is that I think both Churchill and Roosevelt, although in somewhat different ways, were very self-conscious that they were building a different kind of world order in which uh, the Anglo-American relationship in particular would be a cornerstone and, wi and in which multinational institutions, not just the United Nations, but things like the World Bank and, and so forth, would play a critical role. I mean, they, um, they believed that the world had to be kind of structured differently if they were to prevent a third running of the kinds of conflicts that they both experienced in their lifetimes. Um, and we we, were, we had talked a little bit about this at at lunch. You know, one of the one of the consequences of the passing of time is we have lost that generation which remembers World War II. Let's set aside those who fought it, which is people people like my mother who was a teenage girl during the war, and who you know, as I think back on it after she passed away, her her view of international politics has been shaped and she was not a particularly political person, had been shaped by World War II and an understanding that it was important for the United States to exercise leadership in some way, you know, particular issues notwithstanding, and that international institutions mattered and norms uh, 
of some kind mattered and that you couldn't uh, just kind of pull back into your shell and, and all that. Um, and I, I think that's, to me, that's one of the dismaying things about where we are. I mean, America, you know, my blood, okay, I'll put my cards on the table. So I'm one of the, uh, I'm a conservative, which is why I'm no longer a Republican. Um, <laughs> You know, my blood runs cold when people say America first, because that phrase was, that was the movement which was desperately against our engagement in the Second World War. Um, and the America Firsters were the ones who were really fighting Roosevelt during this mm. extremely fraught period from 39 to 41. Um, and it, it troubles me no end that people don't realize, well, you know, that that phrase has historical echoes and resonances which should be very troubling to us. They would have been very troubling to my parents. Um, but they no longer trouble us in the same way because we've forgotten. Yeah, I, I absolutely agree about this, this anxiety of the, the passing of generations that understood the value of international institutions, however flawed they are, because that's part of, you know, just the the small amount of distance we keep between, you know, civilization and the law of the jungle. As to the questions about um, uh, which you, I think, carefully evaded about the, um, uh, you know, put oneself in. Uh, in uh, Churchill, what would Churchill have said now? Well, my answer to these kind of questions is, I mean, it's a, it's a fun kind of question, but, um, uh, you know, it assumes that we are now dealing with a, a different situation, but we have the same person. But, of course, a Churchill if, if in the 21st century would have been a different kind of person because he would have been shaped by a whole lot of other experiences. So I'm not playing that game. My, my hunch with regard to, I'll come back to your question, but my hunch with regard to that question of the summit is I would think, uh, well, I would, would stick my neck out and say that I think Churchill would have regarded that as the kind of gamble that Chamberlain took with Hitler in going to see Hitler, and he would not have got into that kind of face-to-face -face negotiation, which then you know, dignified a, uh, a North Korean dictator. Um, the point about Europe and, and Churchill's attitude you know, to Brexit and things like this, I mean, during the Brexit debate, the, um, uh, Churchill was claimed by both sides because his rhetoric is uh, enticing but um, imprecise. Uh, Churchill gives this amazing speech in 1946 where he says in Strasbourg, you know, so I'm going to tell you an amazing thing, uh, that France and Germany uh, should come together and form uh, the basis of a new united Europe. So what you have there is remarkable vision saying a year after the war's over, you, you two countries have fought the hell out of each other for th on and off for 300 years, kind of get wise and do something different. But then United Europe, what does he mean by this? What does he think Britain's relationship to is? Doesn't really say. And Churchill, you need to remember, is by then out of office. And Churchill's most clarion statements are, uh, are when he's out of office, in the wilderness years in the 1930s, and then what I call second wilderness years from 45 to 51 which is a reminder that a leader in power is much more constrained than a leader out of power. So Churchill, some of Churchill's greatest speeches, the Iron Curtain speech in uh, early 40s, March 46, the Strasbourg speech, are made by a man who is out of office and loves to be in that situation. And uh, you know, the, a, leader, a leader under pressure is somebody who, who can't always, in office, is a leader under pressure who can't say things that who would otherwise say in, 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 if he was a free agent. Yeah. And by the way, I'll, I'll give a somewhat more direct answer about North Korea. I don't think you have to be Churchill to say it was a dumb idea when the Bush administration, which I was part of, tried to do it. It was a dumb idea when the Clinton administration uh, tried to do it. And it's going to be a 
dumb idea now. Um, there's a whole bunch of structural reasons why we're not likely to get anything remotely like the kind of deal that we want. But, but you know, for that, there's more. It's more direct political logic. You don't need. I. We we don't need to put these statesmen up on uh, or credit. We don't have to credit them with, you know, extraordinary powers of vision to understand a problem like that. That's a that's a much more kind of worldly. Uh, problem we can figure out on our own if if we're willing to look at the consequences. Yeah, I mean, I think it, just carrying on from that, is going back to the point about lessons, you know, I think that the value of studying history is not that it provides you with lessons. I think it's about, um, uh, well, what um, Ernest May and, and Richard Neustadt, two historians or political scientists at Harvard, call thinking in time. Yep. Thinking in time. And they said they ran a course for policymakers in which the idea was to say, you know, you're coming at this and you're saying, okay, um, you historians, I want the answer. What's the answer? And what the historians are saying back is, no, don't, you've got the wrong thing in mind. You don't ask, what's the answer? You say, you don't say, how do I get out of this mess? You say, how did we get into it? Let's think historically about this in time. Um, now, that may not immediately generate an answer. It may not be an answer that is politically practicable. But thinking in time, instead of thinking within you know, this week or this, this 24 hours, is what hopefully his, historical thinking can do. The problem is that most people in office don't have the luxury to do that kind of thinking in time. Yeah. But history is not there to provide answers. It's there to create a habit of mind of thinking historically. How did we get into this mess before you start thinking, oh, I want an instant answer. In fact, I, didn't, I, I think Henry Kissinger said that by the time you get into office, it's too late, it's too late <laughs> to start yeah. doing yeah. that. You have, to, you have to have done the work yeah. beforehand. Yeah. Um, any more questions from the audience? Well, then, yes. Speaking of general, generational memory, and there was an allusion to Gallipoli uh, previously, we're in the 100th anniversary of World War I. How did World War I influence both Roosevelt and Churchill, both of whom experienced it, as they approached whether D-Day or wartime leadership? Are you taking another question? Are there any more questions that might be related to that at all? We have to make sure that Sarah gets a question, just to, in order to show how badly she was taught. <laughs> World War I. Um, World War One. Um, well, it's, you know, we talk about, we use the same word, it's a very different experience for the two countries. I mean, for the British, this is four years of fighting, uh, which in many ways we stumble into. I mean, the July crisis, you know, is, I mean, it's not, I mean, Brexit is a different kind of thing, but, you know, as much as anything, it's a cock up how we got into that war as it is for most of those people. And many of that generation, particularly the people closest to power, after the war have nervous breakdowns, going back over the July crisis and thinking, you know, what did we do? It was like a month. You know, June 28th, June 27th, no problems. 4th of July, 4th of August, we're in a war. We're in a war we've never, it's going out of control. So I think for many of that generation in Britain, there's this feeling, you know, that, that, that things started to get out of control for the British then. Plus the fact you, it's the worst war in British history, 750,000 dead. Uh, and there is a real sense, never again, we cannot let that happen again. And if you want to understand Neville Chamberlain in a more positive way, it's that sense, I cannot allow this to happen again to another generation. Um, uh, for Churchill, I think overwhelming, it's, it's that feeling, I can't imagine allowing a repeat of the Battle of the Somme or Passchendaele, the, the losses, the physical losses. And so the, the idea of wearing Germany down, Nazi Germany down, by this peripheral strategy, you know, closing the ring, as he likes to put it, going to North Africa, going to Italy, applying the bombing campaigns and all the rest of it, um, that's how we did it against Napoleon. That's how we can do it again. And it will not cost us the kind of death toll. Um, 
For the Americans, you know, the war comes late, 19, April 17. Uh, there is a, a US army that very deliberately takes time to prepare, to train, and General Pershing is absolutely determined will be used a U, as a US army rather than divisions parceled out to the French, the British, and so on. The Americans are going to fight the war they want when they are ready to do so. And Pershing's conception of the war is actually, when he gets to start fighting in the, in the fall of 1918, is um, let's do it, uh, basically he wants to do it the way the French did it in 1914, which is just you know, massive charges of, 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 of men, um, uh, courage, drive, and all the rest of it. So all the things that the French and the British have learned over several years, Pershing says, you know, is, is rubbish. If, I mean, the casualties in the fall of 1918 are awful. I mean, they're, you know, you, they, they eclipse, you know, most of the, all the Civil War battlefields put, put together in a few weeks. And there's a good book by, I um, uh, um, uh, can't remember the title now, but uh, about actually the war casualties, which said really if, if that had gone on for much longer, there would have been really quite serious reaction back home because of the losses. Um, but so the, in fact, the American war is a brief one, and it seems to be one that um, has never had a big impact in the, in, the, in the States. I mean, it's striking, you know, in D.C., you're only just building a national memorial to the First World War. Previously, there's just been that D.C. memorial to the dead from the d district, uh, you know, away out on the mall. Um, so it's almost like... Yeah, it was a kind of brief thing. We did it. We kind of recanted. We've forgotten it. And we, this is new this time, the second time round. Whereas for the British, the burden of history is enormous, I think. So, um, <clears throat> so a couple of things. That, you know, just, let me start with the Americans. That's true, although uh, it's 100,000 dead within the space of less than a year. By comparison, Vietnam is about 60,000 dead. Our combined losses in Iraq and Afghanistan may be a tenth of that. So it is, and on a much larger population base. So it's, there's a lot of concentrated fighting. It's not remotely on the scale that the uh, British and French, uh, let alone you know, people like the Serbs experience, but it's real. In fact, if you go to... Um, you go to Europe, the largest American military cemetery in the world, uh, it, well, in Europe, rather, mm -hmm. is uh, the cemetery at uh, in the Meuse Argonne, Meuse Argonne yeah. with 14,000 graves, mm -hmm. 14,000 graves. Uh, and it's quite sobering. It makes you realize that, yeah, there were a lot of American kids um, who, who died in that war. I think one of the things that they took away, though, was, particularly the military leadership, a wariness about the British. So the United States Navy hated the idea that this great battleship navy that they had was going to be used for escort of convoy. And it's why people like Admiral King, the chief of He's naval operations, him. when he gets in, he changes the uniform so it won't look like the Royal Navy uniform. That's how the you know, sailor, American sailors end up with tan uniforms, so they won't look like the Brits. The American Army is quite suspicious. It's actually fed by some of their colleagues, so I forget who it was, it may have been Dill or somebody like that, at the beginning of World War II, sends Marshall a copy of uh, General William, Field Marshal William Robertson's World War I memoir, Soldiers and Statesmen, and, and he was very anti-Churchill, say, watch out, this is the guy who's leading us, because Churchill becomes this sort of bogeyman because of the Dardanelles. So that's actually a very important part of the relationship that we tend not to talk a lot about, the, the suspicion that the Americans have that last time we were conned, the British manipulated us, and it, it, it doesn't help that at the beginning of World War II, the British are just so much better at the blocking and tackling of high-level committee work. You know, agendas, minutes, hammering out your own position before you go into the meeting. It's, I mean, it is very much the stuff of departmental mm. meetings mm. in universities. You know, you can do those kinds of things, you really get further. Well, the British were masters of it, and the Americans weren't. Mm -hmm. on, on the British side, um, I would say two things. Churchill learns a very important thing from the Dardanelles, and he says as much, and that is not to overrule his military commanders when they're really opposed 
to something. And so although he gets into these knockdown, drag out fights with um, his military leaders during World War II, it's very hard to think of a time when he overrules them yes. about anything that is serious. Whereas FDR actually had no problem overruling his uh, joint chiefs. But he on, was commander in chief. Uh, yeah. And Churchill was and, not. He, and, and, and he signed his letters commander in chief. Yeah. So, for example, the invasion of North Africa, Marshall and King were dead set yeah, against yeah. that. They thought it was a terrible idea. Roosevelt orders them to do it. He does other things. So there, there's that. The other thing about, um, tr about Churchill in World War I that I think is quite important, people nowadays don't read The, the World Crisis, which is his World War I memoir, which I think was it Shaw say, uh, an autobiography disguised as a history of the cosmos. <laughs> yeah. Um, but it's, it is worth reading because Churchill, as an historian himself, writing that great biography of the Duke of Marlborough, and then um, in World War I, he has experienced war at the top in every position mm -hmm. other than prime minister. You know, he, yes, he's disgraced after the Dardanelles. He goes to the front lines, which is an amazing thing, serving as a major in an infantry unit for, what was it, about eight months or something mm -hmm. like that. He then comes back and he moves into a whole series of very senior governmental positions. So you're dealing with somebody who has had a unique level mm -hmm of high governmental wartime experience, not just as head of the Royal Navy, but basically in every other position, mm. including industrial mobilization. And I think he draws on that <coughs> quite a bit in uh, the Second War. Yeah. So the, we've um, got a, just couple, the, a couple more well, I was just say, quickly. The, um, the, the story, what you just mentioned about the First World War memoirs, it's actually A.J. Balfour, who has a, number of, a couple of very good quotes about Churchill. He said, apropos of the, first, he said, I, he said to his, um, his niece, I have just been reading uh, Winston's uh, autobiography disguised as a history of the universe. <laughs> and the other thing he said to Churchill when Churchill was going on about the need to intervene in the Russian Civil War yep. against the Bolsheviks uh, and was just making complete nuisance of himself in the cabinet, uh, <coughs> Balfour came up to him after he said, Winston, I so admire the exaggerated way you tell the truth. <laughs> <laughs> but, but actually, I, I, could I just ask... We Nick, really do only have, like, two minutes. Go on, then. So, so, I mean, he, he... All true, but he actually writes those memoirs himself, which is an extraordinary thing for a political leader Dictate. to do. Dictate. Well, yes, there's a story to that, but we haven't got to... <coughs> right. He's, he also writes the, an incredible military history well, yes. as the biography of Marlborough. How does that shape how he leads in World War II? <coughs> um, well, I don't think it shapes it directly, the leadership, but what he understands is actually that you have to get your version of history on the table <laughs> early and the the mistakes that he made over the world war one memoirs are not made again so for example he surrounds himself with a team of people who will do the hard work in the archives he has already printed out every <coughs> month as prime minister the uh telegrams and the directives that he's he's issued that month which are there in printed form ready as the basis of the war memoirs and then thirdly, the other element is these amazing stories that he has of his experiences, that it, which he dictates to secretaries. And he stitches all those things together in a book that is you know, far more than a memoir, not quite a history, but uh, you know, just an absolutely unique record, which is still the storyline that we follow today in so many ways. And that is a way, is what part of the, the amazing thing about Churchill, he fought the Second World War knowing that he would write about it as well. And that's quite a remarkable story. I can't think of anything more appropriate than asking Gordon Cohen's uh, gra uh, granddaughter to ask the final question. Hi. Um, we were talking about how it's lonely at the top, and earlier we were talking about how FDR and Churchill were kind of peerless, and that held their relationship together. And I was wondering um, if you could talk a bit about Churchill with Truman and Churchill after FDR, and how that mm. shaped his relationship with America. Quite briefly. He has 
he, he always regrets not coming to Roosevelt's funeral. Um, uh, partly because of the feeling for the president. And one of the reasons, it's, it's not clear why he didn't, but one of the reasons is because the coalition government is about to break up in Britain and Churchill feels he's got to deal with domestic politics. But also because he wanted to actually get the ear of the new president and talk to Truman. Um, the relationship with Truman is, I think, quite um, close. And of course, Truman is happy to use Roosevelt, uh, Churchill in, in March 46 as a kind of stalking horse for a change of policy towards Russia. Truman reads the Iron Curtain speech before it's delivered, and he's you know, perfectly happy with it, as long as he doesn't have to say it. Churchill does. But the relationship is never as close or as intimate as the, that. It's a peacetime relationship. It's a dying, it's, a, it's an ailing uh, man and so on. Whereas this was one, as the exhibition says, that was forged in war, this relationship. All I can say is it's nice to meet another Cohen, even if there's not a direct relationship. There's something <laughs> tribal back there that's a connection. So thank you and your family for sponsoring this. Can we have a round of applause for this fantastic panel? Richard, David, Elliot, thank you very much. They will be signing books in the back. Uh, please join us uh, over at the exhibit in the library. Thanks.